Chad Wesley Smith here, the Jug Life Podcast, video edition, straight from the 2016 Olympic Trails, to avoid any lawsuits. Uh, joined, as always, my co-host, Max Ada, hey. Max Montana, and we have the pleasure today being joined by Danny Carmargo of Carmargo Oli Concepts. Correct. Thank you. In Ocala, Florida? Uh, no, I'm in Orlando, Orlando. Florida. Uh, 30 minutes from Ocala. Okay. But I'm in Orlando. Yeah, Central Florida. In Orlando, Florida. Some of you may know him as Matty Rogers' coach, but he's... Most everybody knows me. I don't only yeah. Matty Rogers' coach. <laughs> Matt, no. A lot of people now know me as the guy who picked up Max Ada very awkwardly yes. in a <laughs> yeah. slightly homoerotic uh, <laughs> re- remake of Commando. <laughs> have you not seen this? I have not. I have not. Well, you'll be, you'll be in for a treat. It's, uh, it's pretty phenomenal. Well, in an incredibly awkward... At least they know way. you, though. At least they <laughs> yeah. know you. Yeah. Danny, why don't you just start off kind of telling us about your, your background as a competitor. I was blessed to have fallen into the sport of Olympic lifting um, at the age of 12. I was a football player, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm blessed to say I was always fairly athletic. I picked up sports very well, and I loved football, so I understood the game, but I was always small, right? I was always tiny. Grown, for, for, grown up in Florida? Yeah, yeah. Um, Florida's my home. University of Miami guy? Huge Miami fan. Okay. Yeah. So uh, my family is from Miami. So my adolescence was spent in Miami. I'm, I'm now in Orlando now because just before high school, we moved uh, to the Orlando area. And I've been there ever since. And so, yeah. And I'm also a Dolphins fan, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I played football. I had an older brother who was, uh, who was a better football player. He was a linebacker for the local high school. And so he tells me, you know, you want to get good at football, you got to get into the weight room and start doing some weight training of some sort. Day one, I show up at the high school and there happened to be a school teacher there. The teacher was, ultimately, he became my mentor, my developmental coach. He was a 30-year veteran of Olympic lifting at that time. And so, you know, it's hard to find, you know, it was, especially back then, you know, now more and more it's a little bit, it's different now, and I know we'll talk about that, but really hard to find Olympic quality, com- competent Olympic coaches back then, and he, he was right in my backyard. Who was this? Coach Bill McDaniel, he went by Coach Mack. Um, he has since passed away and I've taken over as head coach of the team that he was a head coach for at, after his passing, and I'm still the coach of that very same team. So, But first day, he, you know, he sees me walk around the weight room, questions why I'm there, because I was so young to be at the high school gym. And I told him, yeah, I, don't, I just want to lift. I don't know what I'm doing. So he says, hey, what do you know about the clean and jerk? I didn't. And so there was a few guys doing some, some lifts there. And uh, he was so funny, he said, this was his assessment. He goes, well, well, it'll make you strong for football. So that's how he recruited me. And I go, okay, yeah, sure, I'll do that. He says, before I get you started, when you put your hands on top of your head, interlock your fingers, I want you to show me how far you can squat flat-footed without moving. So I did, and I did it well, stood up, and I looked at him and I said, is, is that what you mean? And he goes, yes, I do. Grab that barbell right now, come over to the platform. I did some gymnastics as well when I was younger. And so that kind of helped me. I had good mobility there. So. That was his assessment, and he actually taught me the snatch first and quit every sport since then. So, just all in weightlifting, 12 years old. That's it, specialized at the age of 12. Yeah, so, and you know, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of discussion on that. You know, when do you specialize? When is the best to specialize, right? Some say later, some say early. I'm a product of, of specializing very early, and I'm not saying that's going to be the best case for every athlete in every case. It worked for me, though. I had a blessed, blessed career. I, I went about two and a half years, three years with him. And at the age of 16, the Olympic Training Center out in Colorado was taking high school kids. It was like a pilot program they were doing uh, instead of waiting for you to graduate. And so they put it out there and they pretty much had kind of like an unofficial trials, right? They were just kind of scouting. And Dragomir was the coach of the OTC back then, the national coach back then. And so my developmental coach, Coach Mack, you know, prepares me for it and he says, would you like that opportunity to go while you're still in high school? And I said, getting away from home, hell yeah, I'm out. You know, love you mom and dad, but I want to go. Went to a few uh, meets. They, it was an American Open, 1993 American Open. Juniors, 94, and Senior Nationals was where they were recruiting from. I did well enough, so they took me. So I was a resident at the age of 16 and I stayed until I retired at 21. We could jump back to the idea of the, the early specialization mm-hmm. real quick. I think, you know, when you talk about early specialization, it can mean a lot of things. Like, you were all in on the sport of weightlifting. Yeah. But I wouldn't, yeah, not, not to speak to your case necessarily, but that doesn't necessarily mean that someone is doing specialized training just to weightlifting. Like, you can have a general, like, phasic structure 
to the sure. training. That's something we want to talk to you more about later. Of course, yeah. So Max and I were at a seminar two years ago where Ilya Ilyan, through the translator, said that he started training for weightlifting when he was six years old. Okay. But he would, quote, run around the gym and do all the exercises. Oh, okay. And to me, you know, understanding that process of acquiring sports mastery, like Eastern Bloc ideas, that meant that he did gymnastics, he did swimming, he did mm -hmm. you know, weightlifting drills, calisthenics, all, all these different kinds of things, though he was the training course. only as a weightlifter, Correct. Right. training only for weightlifting. It was not just specialized training. I think that's where the an important distinction to make because you get these you know club soccer players or baseball kids and they their early specialization is practice soccer, play soccer, practice soccer, play soccer, practice soccer, play soccer, practice baseball, play baseball, practice baseball. Right. And that is right. the real problematic structure. Right. Not having the, a dedicated sport, yeah. per se. Yeah, I would, I would say I specialize in the way of it is all that I did. Yeah. Right. Snatch, That's it. Snatch, clean, jerk, snatch, snatch clean, clean, drills. Anything my coach thought of that would work for me. I played nothing. In fact, I tried to play baseball for fun recreationally, and he about kicked my ass. And he says, you can't do that. And I'm like, well, well why? I want to do it because it's fun. I mean, I was 13, 14 years old. Mm -hmm. And he says, it's going to affect your lifting. And I didn't like that. So, of course, you know, he... Uh, he had a heavy influence on me, and uh, it's funny, most of, mo most of his philosophies and the spirit of what we do, I have acquired and I find myself in the same way. My programming, my, my cueing, my technical um, philosophies actually come from Dragomir a lot, so I took from both, both men. But no, you're right. I, when I say I specialize in weightlifting, it is really all I did. It was very little variety. Training volume and programming would be the only variety I would get. So. That's something I was, you know, with, with America coming up so much in, in the youth and junior ranks, that's something I kind of take pause with and, and get worried about a guy like C.J. Cummings mm -hmm. that, yeah. you know, is chasing youth numbers and chasing junior numbers a limited route, you think, in the eventual development of a senior champion. Correct. Uh, and, I've, and, you know, I've heard that conversation come up a few times. And I'm gonna just, you know, I'm, I'm gonna just say it straight the way that coaches talk about it is, is he gonna get burned out, you know? And looking at him, there's no way in heck he's gonna get burned. You wouldn't think in a million years he could ever get burned out. He's looking amazing. And I know his coach uh, fairly well and I mean, great coach. And I've coached along with him at, uh, at Junior Worlds. But that's the conversation going on right now. Is it too young? You know, is he too young to be specializing? And can we keep him What's the longevity, you know, with him? And, and I'm in no position to really give a, a direct opinion what I think. And not he's just, doing just great about right CJ now. either. But, or any athlete, yeah, yeah. We're in the same boat. You know, but he's, look, he's looking great. I mean, with my athletes, luckily now we have CrossFit, right? Which we didn't back in my day at all. I mean, I know the, the methodologies were there, right? But CrossFit as we know it now, it actually gives me a chance to add variety to my athletes. Mm -hmm. And I believe a lot of that, especially the young ones. First, it's fun and it keeps it interesting. Second, it takes care of a lot of movement patterns for me. I know I realize a lot of it's under fatigue, but it still exposes them to a lot of movements, you know. Plus, and it helps with their conditioning overall. I mean, you know, no athlete wants to be third attempt, two minutes on the clock, and you just don't have enough gas, you know, to, to come up with it, so. So based on how you were coached through your, you know, I mean, essentially your whole career up until, I guess, maybe even drag America's system may have been different than yeah. Coach Max. Mm -hmm. How is that similar to what you do now? Is some, some young girl comes in your gym, young guy comes in your gym, similar situation that you started with. Do you start them the same way? Very similar. I do. So I remember when I moved from my developmental coach, Coach Mack, to Dragomir at the OTC. Dragomir taught me, he, he put me through a couple of sessions with him through his progressions, as if I were brand new. And I remember thinking, I'm like, man, I know how to do this stuff. But it was how he wanted me to move. Mm -hmm. And luckily, I was blessed. I was able to produce the exact movement he wanted. And he would say that, right? So that made me feel good for sure. But it's funny enough, the progressions he showed me that very first week at the Olympic Center, I had gone for camps and stuff. I never worked with him. I always worked with the assigned camp coaches, right? So now I'm a resident. Those are my progressions to today. I still use those progressions. Now, going back to Coach Mack, I will say what I took from him and the similarity of how I start someone brand new is I do try to have all my beginners do a ton of movements every session. I mean, as many as you can, 
you can fit in in a reasonable amount of time. That came from, from Coach Mack for sure. My assessment's a little different <laughs> than the hands on top of my head and a, and a squat. I, I do I, some, somewhat similar to the way I was programmed at the beginning. So you became an OTC resident in 1994 mm -hmm. at what, age 17? 16. 16. I, turned, I turned 17 later that year, but yeah. So that, that's, people are starting to gear up for Atlanta Olympics. Mm -hmm. You're there with, was Mark Henry a resident? Yes, he was. Tim McRae, Wes Barnett, <clears throat> Jeff Macy. I mean, some of those guys, uh, <clears throat> some stayed in the sports now, but yeah, some of the old names, you know, big time. Vernon Pateo was there still too. So looking at, looking at that time, you know, 96 Olympics, 20 years ago, what is the biggest change, positive change, you've seen in USA weightlifting in those in that time? Since the era, the, since back then, there's more competition. I think there's more people doing it and at a higher level. Bigger numbers, more people doing bigger numbers, right? You know, back then it looked like there was always a big gap. You have your gold medalists at all the national meets and then there's a huge drop off for everybody else. That's not the case now. I mean, if you're looking at our, if you're looking at results now, it seems like the top three, top five, type six are fairly close together and they can go either way, you know? So I think that just gets the best out of every athlete. And of course, the biggest positive change is just, uh, I don't even call it popularity because we're not quite there yet, right? I mean, people still ask me when they say, what do you do? I say, I'm a weightlifting coach. Weightlifting, yeah. weight, weightlifting the sport of, right? Yeah, and it's how much do you bench? And I'm saying, I don't. In fact, Coach Mack would never allow me to bench. He said it would have negatively affect the snatch. And so I really never benched, right? I mean, we know now you can, you just gotta maintain proper mobility and everything else, but I think that's the biggest change. It's just, uh, there's just more awareness. I mean, 930 something athletes at American Open four or five months ago. I mean, are you kidding me? There's four platforms. And uh, a lot of newer coaches struggled with how to manage multiple athletes yeah. in a session. So they would come up to me knowing that I've had so much time in the sport and they say, is this right? Are they allowed to do this? And I go, oh yeah, buddy, welcome. <laughs> welcome to the sport. You know, now, you know, now you have to run back and forth. I mean, I just, you know, we're having this, this interview now, um, 10 minutes after I just finished a session with two lifters and they were at opposite, opposite ends of the venue. And luckily I had coaches to help me out, but that's the biggest change, man, I think is, uh, there's not such a big gap between one and everybody else, the number one and everyone else. With those people though that you, you named, I mean, those are still guys, Wes Barnett, you know, still holding American records 20 years yeah. later. Yeah, sure, yeah. What do you see as maybe a failure of the system to develop in those, in those 20 years, with especially considering the increased popularity? I mean, there's gotta be four or five times as many yeah. lifters, 10 times as many, mem I mean, USAW members. All right, uh, I have an answer to that, you know, and I've thought about this. I think the biggest failure, and I, I don't even know if I want to call it a failure, but you know what, yeah, I mean, I guess we can say that looking back now. Let's look at CrossFit, right? CrossFit, no, and I don't want to just put all of the thanks to CrossFit, although CrossFit had a huge, huge influence to the sport of Olympic lifting, but so did the strength and conditioning industry. I mean, the sports performance world, I mean, those strength coaches are really understanding more and more over the last 15 years, I would say, how important the power snatch, the power cleans might be, some Olympic lifts might be for their athletes, right? And so I think that the failure was how we recruited. It, it took me to witness the growth of the sport after the fitness and the functional fitness industry grew to realize that the way we recruited historically was always, let's go for the young ones, right? The youth and the juniors, so middle school, high school age, let them know that the snatch and clean and jerk exist, but let's let them know that the sport exists, right? And so I think the error, and, and look, that was the way I was taught to recruit. So this is what I did. I used to do little demos at middle schools to try to bring in athletes at early on when I became a coach, right? And it was, here's a sport, here's a snatch, here's a clean and jerk. It's great to compete, 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 compete. It was all about recruiting young ones to be directly involved in competition, which would make sense. But then you have CrossFit that came in and said, well, you don't have to compete in it, but here's a snatch and clean and jerk for metabolic conditioning. Here's the snatch and clean and jerk for fun, 
not the stress of wearing a singlet, if that's the weirdest thing you've ever seen or put on for your first time. I remember the first time I put on a singlet, and man, I wish I could show you an image right now. I used to wear the slingshot looking singlet, you know what I'm saying? That was the most disgusting. Yes, man, exactly. And that's what was told to me, this is what you're gonna wear. I don't know how I stayed in the sport after that, honestly. But you know, I love the movements, and that's, that's what I'm talking about here. I fell in love with the movements. I had someone interview me once before and said, when you first started lifting, what, what appealed to you about it? You know, why that and not another sport? Since I played almost everything on, up until that point, and I said, it felt cool. I don't know how else to say it. I remember the first time I caught a snatch, and it was one of those, you know, you snatch, you snatch, you snatch, you hit one, that's perfect. And then you can't repeat it again, right? Until you learn, right? It's like a golf swing. But I remember that feeling and thought, that was cool as shit. I love that feeling. And so that's what appealed to me. Well, I think the way we're recruiting was wrong. That was our failure. I think we should have, and, and this is, you know, retrospectively, I think had we recruited young ones and made it more of a uh, more fun thing without the pressure of competition, maybe we'd have, we would have retained more people. I mean, because I think that's what CrossFit did. And now you're using the snatch and clean and jerk for your fitness. And see, I remember, let's go three years ago, the talk of, CrossFit has revitalized weightlifting. Well, back then, my argument was no. All it did was expose the movement, but we still have the same participation rate, and we don't have any more record-breaking than we had in the past. That's different now. So it was, it was like the phase hadn't quite hit, right? Now, I think people are converting. I get people walking in my gym almost weekly saying, I have been CrossFitting for X amount of time. I still love it, but I really want to spend more time on Oli, right? And so I said, great, you came to the right place, let's do that. Now I own a CrossFit gym in Orlando and I consider myself a CrossFitter too, because I, all I do now are, are Metcons for my personal fitness. I'm not a competitor, I'm a coach, right? So I think that was one of the biggest failures. Here's the other one, there's a second part to that. And it's back then, the master's division, let's talk about that for a second, right? The master's division, the face of the master's division was always the older brackets the 60 plus, the 50 plus, dominated, right? Not many 35 plus, right? Or maybe say 45 and below, but that's different now. Now, and I took nine athletes to the Masters Nationals last month, and it was a two platform meet. Over 200 and something athletes. Five. Five? It was 500. Get out. Yeah. So maybe I'm thinking just one day was 200 and something. Yeah, it was 500. Okay, it was 500. Well, there you go. You have two, you have two platforms. So I think you had to justify two platforms. And that just makes my point stronger in that now the face of Masters Division is much younger. Well, those younger Masters uh, athletes, 35 to say 45, are falling in love with the sport, realizing it's really not too late. You can still have some success in this sport. And they have children. Right? And, and uh, I'm the president of the LWC in Florida, and we've recruited this old school way that I just outlined, but I've been trying to recruit more and more in a different capacity. Now I'm, I'm talking to those masters now and saying, get involved with the sport. They fall in love with it, they have kids, and so now you just have this exponential growth. And so I believe that would be the, the, the biggest failure I can think of. Yeah, I, I'm totally on board with you, I mean, with really both of those points. I think that. The other recruiting area that's untapped is college athletes coming out of college, yeah. transition into a new sport. Colin Burns, Anthony Pomponio, Ariel Stevens, Morgan King, all yep. athletes in different sports. But with the, with the CrossFit thing, yeah, I totally agree that I think it's kind of a pipe dream to think that we're going to get a lot of 12-year-olds who are in your situation okay. who do weightlifting day one. And I love this. This is all I want to do. Yep. And even if they do do that, that the way that they're going to be best developed over the long term, in my opinion, is not snatch, clean, jerk, squat, snatch, clean, jerk, squat. It's got to be gymnastics. It's got to be fun. It's got to be more general movements. And then as they progress and advance, then more specific, more specific, more specific. Mm -hmm. But I think that that is the big boom of CrossFit. Because you see, you know, when you look at the USAW membership, uh, I think it's a little misleading sometimes. People say oh, it's, it's increased 10 times. Uh, or, or eight times, however much, but when you look at it, it's, it's half coaches and half athletes. Yeah. Well, those coaches and athletes, there's probably a lot of overlap between the people. There's a lot of overlap, yep. And it's these, you know, 
CrossFit coaches trying to bolster their resume, trying to improve as weightlifting coaches. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to be the ones who maybe are on the 2016 Olympic team or the 2020 Olympic team. Mm -hmm. But it's those, you know, 30-somethings, 40-somethings whose kids now, for sure, that they know about, they know that weightlifting's a thing. Yep. And they say, Mom and Dad do this. It's, it looks really cool. I want to do that, too. If kids want to do what their parents do, I don't know if that's... Yeah. <laughs> it's still a thing. I've got several whole families that are in my box and, uh, and train. Yeah. I'm still... Listen, I'm living a dream, man. I am living a dream. I'm going to ride this puppy because I don't know that it's going to be around forever. Now, I'm not a pessimistic guy. If you've asked around, you ask anybody around me, I'm very positive. You know, I just love what I do and definitely not cynical in any way. But I do know what it looks like when it was very unpopular. And I'm scared. I'm scared that it'll go back to the dark ages, you know, and I hope it never does. And there's plenty of people who don't think it ever will. But this is why I'm spreading myself thin. I do burn the, uh, the candle at both ends when it comes to seminars, certs, training lessons, training athletes, expanding my Oli Concepts team to as many locations as possible and, and more coaches. I'm really, really big into developing coaches. I'm very picky about my coaches, you know. I think it's about growing and I'm just trying to get as much as I possibly can because if it ever gets to, you know, the point where it's just not a thing and it turned out to be a surge in popularity that dies out and it goes back to the dark ages, like I said, at least I can say that I, I took full advantage of, you know, of the times where there were people wanting to learn about the barbell because I never thought I would see that. It's kind of funny because I think I, I can relate to that feeling too, where what you, you see is like weightlifting has become cool. Yeah. A lot of people think it's really cool and there's a lot of like trendy coolness about it mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff is always fleeting. Yeah. Right? And the lifestyle, yeah, this is all that, this is the, you know, anything, right? The fashion, the right? Yeah, the outfitting. And the, it's, yeah. it's cool for a time, and when it's not cool, the, the top surface layer of people, which is a big chunk, I'm mm -hmm. sure, that are in, just kind of disappear, they fizzle out, right? Yeah. And so there's a lot of concern, I think, any coach who's been in it long enough or has been around the sport long enough is going to see that and feel it, where there's almost an apprehension about, yeah. like, you gotta be careful about thinking that this is just gonna be around for another 30 years, you know? I mean, I hope so. Yeah, we all, of course, yeah, yeah, we all hope it's gonna be there, but it's that kind of like, there's something about it that like a lot of what's going on, it hasn't become, it's not at the bedrock. Right. It's a lot on the surface where there's a lot of this like, it's, it's exciting and fun and cool. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, if we don't capitalize the right way as a group and really pull people in, in the long term, like I think you're talking about with masters and families and people becoming involved in it because they love it, right. you're gonna end up with a lot of people that kinda disappear, yeah. you know? Yeah, disappear, like it's funny, I, uh, I'm 38 years old now, and as you know, I mean, I just said it, I learned the snatch and clinic when I was 12, and I've never left. And I had a wonderful, wonderful weightlifting career, junior worlds three times, I was the number one junior ranked two years in a row, several junior Pan Ams. Back then they called it something different. I had senior Pan Ams. I made some senior international trips as well. I mean, my goal was to make the Olympic team in 2000, Sydney. You know, that would have been great. I didn't make it there because I did get burnt out. I woke up one morning and said, screw this, man. I'm done. I'm sick of being achy. I'm sick of cutting weight. I'm sick of worrying about it. I just got burnt out. How yeah. old were you when you did that? Uh, 21, which is biologically very young. Yeah. I had another 10 in me, and it's funny enough, watch this, here's a story. So I wake up from, at the OTC, and, uh, and I'm not saying anything bad about the OTC. In fact, I would do it all over again, right? With the aches and pains, with the drama, with the stress. I don't care, you know? It's something that I'll take to the grave with me. It was an amazing experience, and clearly helped me out years later for, you know, as a coach now. I woke up one morning, and I said, I just cracked. I said, I can't do this anymore, right? Physically beat up, mind you, it's nine years of lifting, nine years of specialized lifting, right? So I walked down to then Dragomir and the assistant, Bob Morris, who I have great relationships with them both now, still to this day. When I see them at meets, you know, we embrace and we, we catch up on, on old times, but I sat down with them and I said, this is how I'm feeling, right? This is the way I feel. My spirit is just broken right now. I'm tired. I don't care that I hit a PR two days ago. 
right? Because it's funny enough, though I was, I was mentally and just emotionally just beat down, my performance was still increasing. I was never, I'm proud to say, man, I was never on the bubble or given a deadline to hit a certain total or they were gonna excuse me from the program. I was always increasing for that entire time. But I told them how I was feeling and I, I just, I didn't know what to do about that, right? It's like a bad breakup, right? And so they, uh, they didn't tell me what I wanted to hear. I didn't know what I wanted to hear at the time, now I know, and that was take a vacation, right? Take a month off. At the level that I was at, I was a senior international lifter while a junior, take a month off. I think that would not have negatively affected the long-term career, you know? And, uh, and I know that now, but I, as an athlete, I didn't know if that would be okay, right? Heck, two days off and you're getting frantic. Something's bad's gonna happen with your training, it's gonna throw off the cycle, right? And uh, they said no. You know, they said, listen, you, you have a spot here. You know, we need you, you'll be fine. And I was like, can you just give me one extra day off a week? Just one extra, give me a session off. One extra session off a week. I just feel like I need to recover, you know? I just feel like I need a little bit of a break. And, you know, I felt bad because it, it's almost as if maybe, maybe they thought I was uh, quitting, you know, I don't know. Now, they had jobs on the line. I, I get it now what, you know, what it meant for them. And Dragomir was a tough, tough man to be a coach for, and I loved it. I'm, like I said, most of my programming philosophy comes from him. And they said, uh, you know, uh, shit, or, shit or get off the pot, really. We need you here, you can't go anywhere. If you decide to leave, we're gonna put someone in your spot. I mean, that's what it came down to. And I'm not saying that that was a bad um, meeting. I'm not saying that's a bad um, philosophy to have. I'm in a scholarship program, right? It's just not what worked for me. And I said, okay, uh, I'm out, I, I'm leaving. And I retired, absolutely hung it up. Man. And, to this, and I don't regret it, I don't regret it. It's funny, so people say, do you regret ever finishing or uh, retiring early, quitting? And I said, first of all, I didn't quit, I retired, <laughs> I was done. No, I didn't. First of all, I, uh, I left, I came home, home was back in Orlando. I spent about a year soul searching, figuring out what the heck I was gonna do with the rest of my life. But it did allow me to get away, the getaway that I needed. My comeback was as a coach. It's funny how I got started at coaching. I didn't want to, I wasn't ready. I was angry with the sport of weightlifting and I was upset. And uh, I went to visit my coach, Coach Mack, who was still in the high school, still yelling at young kids. And, uh, and he was upset with me for retiring early. In fact, when I saw him to visit him and just say hello and check in and on him, he says, not even hello to me, right? He was kind of a grumpy old man like that, but he loved me. He says, you quitting at your age may not be, you quitting may not mean much to you at your age, but it means a ton at mine. And I said, come on, why is everybody so angry with me? This is what I wanted, you know, I, I needed a break, I needed something. At any rate, I, I, I got you coach, I'm sorry, you know, whatever, maybe I'll make a comeback. I just said it to please him, right? There was a kid training next to him and I said, can I help this kid out? He's messing something up. Coach goes, yeah, yeah, go. Just go help him out, tell him whatever you want. So I go up to the young man, I go, hey, listen, my name is Danny. He's like, oh, I know who you are. I said, oh, cool, I've been gone a year and you still know that I am, that's nice. You fix your feet, let me just give you some advice. It worked, kid lit up from that day forward and it got me coaching at the young age, 22. So I started coaching. So I don't regret retiring lifting when I did because what it allowed me to do was actually switch and contribute and give back to the sport that I really did deep down love, but in a different capacity. And I got all my mistakes done with early mm -hmm. and was able, blessed with some decent athletes, man, over the years and promoted. I mean, I'm a senior international. I've got the highest level now, level of USW's standard of coaching and, and um, status. And I'm only 38, you know, I think I, and I'm a lifer, man, I'm not going anywhere. And so looking back, if those gentlemen at the OTC would have told me, take a month off, come back, clear your head, come back, let's keep going, I would have. And I think I probably would have survived another five or six years. So, but that didn't happen, you know, they gave me an ultimatum. Well, that's you know, very cool that that story has worked out with a very positive. Very man. Yeah, mm -hmm. not yeah. positive ending, but just positive continuance of the, of the story, because I'm sure so many other people, that's the, the end of their involvement in yes, yeah. weightlifting or whatever sport that they come to that you know burnout point in and that they yeah. look back on it and and they hate it and they have their have regrets so it's very cool to hear that uh, yeah, that you don't 
So one of those fine athletes that you've gotten to work with and one of those people who's making weightlifting you know, cool and popular is Miss Martha, mm -hmm. Martha Rogers, Maddie Rogers, Maddie Cakes. And tell us about your, your first interaction with her, how, how you guys got connected. About four years ago now, she came into my gym as a cheerleader, former gymnast, but the gymnastics, her gymnastics experience and training was really for cheerleading for the majority, right? Even though, you know, she started as tumbling and all of that. She was uh, 16, almost 17, and she came to my gym to get into CrossFit. She had a cheer coach, and the cheer coach was actually my client and a CrossFit competitor on the side. And he's the one who actually told me about her and said, hey, you know, I have a cheerleader in my gym. She works also teaching some basic tumbling to their young group. And uh, she's one of my main athletes in their competitive group. And she does and performs uh, stunts that are usually reserved for the men. So that actually helps in their choreography and everything that they do. And uh, they had a good squad and they do nationals and things like that locally. And they're about a, maybe a mile or two away from my gym. So he says, you may want to take a look at her. She's got a lot of energy. She's, um, I, I give her things to do and she wants extra and I just can't keep up with the amount of work she can handle. So maybe uh, CrossFit would be good for her. And I said, bring her in. So she shows up <clears throat> and the very first day I met her, I taught her before doing a CrossFit workout, I had her perform the snatch. She didn't even know what it was. I introduced it to her. And that very first day, I think she like snatched 125, right? 55 kilos, roughly 55 kilos and says, uh, drops the bar, I remember clearly, and she looks over to me and I'm going, I might have something here, right? <laughs> and she says, was that okay, was that good? Well, I already knew she was a competitor, right? Even by the way, I, when I would cue her, just the, just, I can almost hear her thoughts and she just wanted to get it perfect, right? She is a perfectionist, she'll even tell you that. And it has its good and bad moments, being a perfectionist. And I, I can just tell, you know, when you do this long enough, you know, it's, we're in a people-oriented job, right? So I was able to size her up, to, so to speak, and realize that I had a talented athlete in my hands and that she likes to compete. Plus, the coach I brought her in, her cheer coach, said so. So when she says, is that good, I, I downplayed it like I really wasn't. And I said, well, I don't know, there's a lot of work to do. You know, you can come back and I can try to make you stronger. And she's like, I'll be back tomorrow. I go, hell yeah. Well, now she's doing CrossFit wads and was like beating some of the men in my gym. From the start, she was only interested in CrossFit and wanted to go to the CrossFit Games. So for me, you know, as a coach, I, the story I just told you and the pressure I was under, I'm a no pressure kind of coach. If this is what you want to do, let's do it. I'll be here for you. You want to do something else? I'll help you with that. If you don't, then don't worry about it. But I don't force any of my athletes to do one thing or the other. Uh, it's their career, right? I've already had mine. And it was a wonderful career that I don't care to relive but that I don't regret in any way. It's about them, what they want. I always put athletes first, and I know that I'm known for that because they, they tell me that, and my athletes understand that. So CrossFit's what you want, Maddie, that's what we're gonna do. And so uh, she entered the Open 2013 and performed fairly well. Unbeknownst to us, CrossFit was starting to bring in teens to the CrossFit Games. Back then they called it the Varsity Gauntlet. It wasn't quite calling it the Games. It was, they were just testing it out. And this might have been the second year, I believe, when we got the call. And they said, hey, you have an athlete in your gym. These are some of the results. We are pretty much inviting her to compete at the CrossFit Games in a team division. So we said, let's do it. So we went and we won it. Wad 2 happened to be max clean, no jerk. I was like, these guys must not know that I'm coming. So first wad, she ended up you know, mid-pack, but really scored some points on the clean. Wad three, she finished it up, and it was all in one day, and she won it. So we came back home, and you can just imagine how fired up she was next year, which it would have been, been too close. Next year, I want to go to the CrossFit Games with the adults. So I'm thinking, okay, maybe not next year, but the year after, right? Well, as we're doing this and we're training, I started introducing her more and more to weightlifting, but see, she's a junior at this point. And I don't, I mean, everyone knows, if you have a talented juniors, you know, juniors have a lot of opportunity. And so I said, you know, I can get this athlete a lot of opportunity if she wants it. And, um, and she could probably go very far, very quickly. 
And if she doesn't survive by choice in her senior years, which she just entered this year, that's her choice, but at least as a junior, I knew I had an international athlete in front of me. And so I encouraged her, but I didn't push it on her because I knew that's not what she wanted, at least at that time. She actually declined going to a junior nationals one of those years because eh, I just want to do CrossFit. So we actually skipped out completely from an entire year where I know she would have done well. Well, eh, we did some local meets. I run a state championship every year. That was really fun for her. And uh, she was starting to meet more and more kids in the gym, more teens that were just doing weightlifting only. And so we decide, um, she says, well, you know, I might do a weightlifting meet here or there. So we did to a local one. Funny enough, she bombed in snatch on her first weightlifting meet ever. If you ever talk to her, she, you should give her shit about that too. She bombed out and says, well, what does that mean? I go, nothing, we're gonna go do a clean and jerk, we'll be fine. She's like, okay. <laughs> and had a decent uh, clean and jerk after that. Well, we go to another one and she easily qualified for the junior nationals. So she decides, I guess I'll go to junior nationals. I said, yeah, finally, let's do this. We go, and this was the one in Denver, I guess 2013, if I'm not mistaken. She had a six for six day, bronze medal, and we come home, and she is the first alternate on the junior Pan Am team. I always look at the ranking, that's what I do. So I see it, I see her name on it, and I just said, hey, this was cool, good job. Your name is here on this list. And she goes, well, what does this list mean? I go, well, this is, uh, this is Team USA, right? This is like cool, really like international stuff. She goes, well, what's it mean to be number eight? And I go, oh, well, you're a first alternate. That's great. And she goes, well, well, do I go? And back then, I think the Junior Pan Ams, actually, we were hosting it in Reno that year. And I said, no, 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 you don't get to go. I said, if you were seven or better, you would go. So I saw her react to it and say, well, what's it gonna take to get top seven? I go, well, I'm glad you asked because I already have it figured <laughs> out. So what you gotta do is you gotta hit this, you gotta hit that, we gotta go to the hassle-free beat because that was, though locally sanctioned, it was one that they were allowing for her to, you know, for anyone to, so it was like a trials thing. Yeah. And this is, you know, and I don't know if we'll get a chance to talk about this here, but this is back in the, um, in that, that short era where, you know, a lot of people were upset with the multiple trials thing, right? That was like a hot controversial topic, but it benefited us. Now, I'm not saying I'm a fan of multiple trials. I mean, back in my day, there was only two meets you ever had a chance to do anything in, right? It came down to only those two meets, but it did benefit us. She goes, yet another six for six performance, ends up bumping everyone and becomes the number one junior. So she comes home and she's like, okay, so I did it? I go, you did it. We're going to Junior Pan Ams. And that led to Junior Worlds that year. She ends up quitting CrossFit and says, I want to do weightlifting. And I go, finally. <laughs> About time, um, although from time to time for fun, she, she'll, she'll jump into a couple med cons and you know, she's not afraid of, of you know, cardio. What do you think it is, I mean, besides obviously being tremendously competitive, and I think anyone who spends five minutes around her sees, sees that. The girl competes in anything. Yeah. Any, how fast we can finish meals, who can be to the gate first at flying out somewhere, and she's just, yeah, 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 go ahead, she's very competitive. What else do you think it is besides that competitiveness that's helping her be so successful. Yeah, she's a perfectionist, and I touched on that a minute ago. She is competitive, but see, we all are, right? We're all very competitive, and I think the other aspects that, that help her be um, so successful, you know, in a short period of time, is she is a perfectionist, but she's also not the type of competitor that's a sore loser. You know what I mean? I think that helps. I, it helps for me. That's, I think, why we get along. I believe in sportsmanship. I'm an old school weightlifting guy, though I'm still young. I was raised by an old school grassroots old timer, you know, and she um, is a good sport. She hates to lose, but will handle it well, you see? So it's not very long we stay in a bad spot, you know, at, at all. I mean, you know, she'll has her bad days or if she goes to a competition, doesn't perform the way, you know, we're not spending a whole week dwelling on it. She does get over things very, very fast because she's so hungry to move on. That perfectionist uh, nature, I think, comes from maybe her gymnastics, maybe choreography and cheerleading, because she will kill herself to make sure she ends on a positive rep. I don't care what day it is or what phase of training it is. I think there are more times where I feel as the coach, call it a loss, let's wrap up, let's try again tomorrow, you know what I mean? There's a time where you just gotta let it go. She won't, you know, she really won't. 
And out of that, those moments, she's actually proven me wrong plenty of times because somehow after two and a half hours on the same damn thing she won't give up on, she will end, end well and say, now I feel better. So I think, I think that's what helps her. Uh, and another thing that I'll add is, you know, I, I haven't gotten too many questions on how could she have gotten so good so fast. Um, I, I'm sure that's in people's minds. I would as a coach on the outside looking in, I mean, how can she just every meet she PRs? It's because she's still sport young, yeah. Yeah. you know? With she, a great background. With a huge background, which leads to your point. What about those college kids that are switching sports? And you named a few that are entering weightlifting, having a, an extensive background somewhere else. You know, the only difference with Maddie is that, again, I think she has the exact same amount of growth and increase you would expect from any beginner. Just so happens that background makes that, that rate of increase at a higher level. Yeah. And her muscles are made of the good stuff. I mean, she obviously has great genetics. She's wired right. Yeah. Yeah. Her father was a, was a D1 football player. And uh, her mom, an athlete, I forgot what sports, but pretty, um, pretty high level too, so yeah. And yeah, I think people maybe looking from the outside or haters or whatever, they, they want to say, oh, it's just genetics or it's, it's whatever. I mean, yeah, I've gotten to spend quite a bit of time with Maddie and she came with us to the Arnold in, in Columbus a few months ago. Yeah. And the Arnold, there's just long ass days on your feet. Yep. So we were, yeah, she flew in about 11 o'clock on Thursday night and we left the hotel at 7.45 in the morning on Friday to head to the venue. Mm -hmm. And you know, from 8.30 until 5.30, she was on her feet, taking pictures, smiling, dealing with weird creepers from the internet, <laughs> you know, all of those kind of things. She told me about those. Yeah. <laughs> never complaining, never you know, anything. And then what, where she would normally train a double, she goes, to the gym, you know, we all go to the gym, and she trains 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Yeah. Takes her double session, puts it in one. You know, never faltering anything about it. You know, it's, I'm, I, she's a way harder worker than I am. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. So to do that, and then the next day to do it again. Yeah. And you know, to have these these long days and and just unwavering in her work ethic, unwavering in her focus. Yes. That, yeah, and I'm gonna t I'll start off by saying I am very glad to hear that positive report about her behavior and her, her attitude uh, that she was on her feet, like you said, so many hours and smiling the whole time and, and all of that because she and I have a very close relationship, right? I am her coach. She trusts me. I trust her as an athlete, which is why, and I was going to touch on this later, there's a lot of things she calls the shots on, and I do that because I trust her and her awareness, right? Because we've had some long days, and man, I don't hear the end of it. So I'm glad she was nice for you and she smiled for you. But if I were there, she'd probably be bitching, man. And she'd be like, blaming it on me, you know? But, uh, you know, I joke because we do get along. We get along very well. Um, which, I mean, you, you must see. I think if we didn't, we wouldn't have lasted this long together. So um, she doesn't give up, man. She, uh, she, she won't let things go when it comes to her training. Last week, we had the privilege of participating in that 100 Days Out event held by the USOC, NBC Networks was there in New York City. It was awesome, it was a great event. She accepted the event, I accompanied her. There were some regrets because we both were under the depression. We would show up, do some interviews, and leave the next day, but it turned out to be a very long schedule. Minute by minute was mapped out. Yeah, she was from like six in the morning to yeah. nine at night. <laughs> nine at night, yeah. and nine at night it was ending with her training session, much like when she was at the Arnold you just described. She I had to get up early, do some photo shoots, be on the Today Show, which was really awesome. Uh, other athletes were you know, succumbing to the same schedule, but every half hour block, it was another photo shoot, another interview, some demos, um, a sign, meet and greets, you know, and all for you know, promoting the Olympics that are coming up. And, and it was a great, and I told her, look, this doesn't happen all the time, man, live it. You know, because it didn't happen when I was around, right, when I was the athlete. But we went all day, just like you described, Luckily for us, it fell in a day or two where we could have modified training just to get through it without any, you know, any, any issues. It was last week, so it was kind of still around our heavy, our heavy training. At the end of the day, I said, what do you want to do? You want to call it? Take a rest day. You can take a rest day. I didn't want many, just one. She said no. So we caught a cab, found a local CrossFit gym, and she banged out a two-hour session, and it was not pretty 
It wasn't the best thing. It caused her some frustration because of that. But she just would not stop, you know? And, uh, you know, I guess that's part of being a champion, man. You can't, it doesn't come easy. So it may seem like it comes easy to her, but she does, she works her ass off. What can you, uh, I think a lot of people kind of wonder, I guess I don't know exactly where your philosophy is other than what you said of Dragomir, but your actual model of training for Maddie in particular, but then other people I'm assuming follow similar structures. Yeah. Um, like the actual nuts and bolts, not necessarily in super detail, but mm -hmm. you know. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, I periodize her training. We've undulated quite a bit. So, you know, we may have some earlier week or earlier days of a week, some lighter, some high volume stuff. Um, and, and, and end of the week can tend to be heavier. She responds well to both, whether I do a linear periodization or, or I undulate a little bit with her. She's definitely a double session girl. She loves tons of technique work, even though I think she's very consistent and doesn't need it. She still wants it and I, let her, I, I give it to her. You know, my philosophy is this, like anything, you have your phases of training where you're conditioning. Then you got your meats and the potatoes in the middle and then it's your, your max effort. I don't stay in high intensity very long. I'm like 10 days of high intensity no matter what. And then I pull back, especially for the lighter body weights. And when it, you know, when it comes to Maddie, it's, it's funny because I can train a beginner and an intermediate lifter and they don't make any decisions. I make all the decisions 100% and I tell them what they need. I always hear how they feel about it though, because it helps me guide how I should better make decisions for them. So it's not always my way or the highway, but you make all the decisions. And then there's this transition that occurs with an athlete. When they get to that level and you just, you know you're there. Um, visibly, you know you're there when, you know, the movement patterns they have at the heavy loads is almost identical to that of the light. That, that, and then you know how they, they have the control. Now I'm saying, okay, now I have an advanced athlete. Maybe they're not strong yet, but you know, relative to them, they're handling heavy loads appropriately. But then that's that next phase where what they're saying and when they're asking for is so accurate to what you're seeing. Now you know that they have this awareness. Maddie hit that very early with me. I mean, she's been dedicating herself to weightlifting three years now, two and a half, almost three years. Within the first 12 months, 18 months, I can see that she was very in tune with her body, with her body in space, with her training and her recovery. There were times where I thought she was pushing too hard, but it turned out she wasn't. That was what she needed. Her work capacity is amazing. She's wired right, you know. She recovers very well. The rate of recovery is just amazing. She calls a lot of shots. Interestingly enough, about six months ago, I had written a really good program you know, for her, and I was proud of it. She loved it. She responded very well to it, but wanted to make some adjustments. So we repeated the cycle of training, and she logged more than she had ever logged before. And now, at the end of it, the conclusion is what we actually did versus what was programmed. Um, we ended up taking that to guide our very next program. And really, we find ourselves, even as, as late as yesterday, what are we gonna do in training today now that we're here at Nationals at the Olympic Trials? And she says, let me see what I did last cycle on this very day in relation to competition day. Oh, we did this, but we adjusted that because here are all my notes. I go, well, that's what we're gonna do. And so it's, it's pretty amazing, you know? And so when my younger athletes see that I'm letting her call the shots, eh, it's kind of hard. They see that she's an amazing athlete and it sucks because I don't want them to think it's uh, that I play favorites. Why don't you let me do that? Well, because you don't know what the hell you're doing. That's why you can't do it, okay? It's because I trust her and I know that she knows. So a lot of times I ask her, what do you want to do? Decisions, uh, not so much in competition, but training, especially heavy training. She hits a lift. I liked it. Maybe she didn't. We have to have the discussion. I said, like, what do you want to do next? She's like, I want to repeat. I want to go up. I want to make this up. Go ahead. Do it. So it's not that she's Princess Maddie Cakes. It's because I'm faced with an elite athlete who understands. And after all, they're the ones who can feel what's going on. I, I can only see it. I think that's you know, tremendously important for people to understand and something I talk about a lot is, is athletes taking ownership of their training. Yeah. You have a, you know, and I'm dealing more with, with powerlifters and which is much less involved than the training of weightlifters, 
but people have to understand the, the why behind the what of the program. Mm -hmm. Because if they're just, some people may be successful just mindless lifting robot, and the coach says, yeah. put it on the bar, and they, and they do it. But I think this type of relationship is, for most people, gonna be much more successful in the long term that they can influence what they're doing and, and understand the reasoning behind it. So that's, that's great to hear that, that you guys have that kind of, uh, really? kind of structure. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm thankful that even though she's empowering or empowered to do, like you just said, they took ownership and accountability over their own successes, she does still depend on me. She'll act like she doesn't. <laughs> She'll tell you, nah, I got this. But I know deep down she does. She doesn't have to say it. It's just a look on her face. It's how she can take a rep, drop the weight, and always look to see if I'm attentive. You know, because she also, she also trains with the team, which is funny because it's not always just Maddie and I in the gym together privately. There are sessions where that does happen, but by and large, she's with 15, 18 other juniors, collegiate athletes that I have, and I'm floating around the floor attending everybody. So I don't always watch everything that Maddie does. There's plenty of sessions. She's either alone or I miss half the things because I'm with someone new, a beginner. And, uh, and that's not even an issue. It's an issue between us because she has taken a, a big ownership, but she'll drop a weight or drop a set and will still consult with me. You know, what should I do? Would it, well, what did you think of that one? She'll ask me, you know. I think uh, something that both Max and I have, you know, admired from afar about Maddie's training, so about your programming, is this understanding of phasic structure yeah. and seeing her squat sixes and eights mm -hmm. and tens Something that seems like a lot of weightlifting coaches are apprehensive about, yes. afraid of. Yeah. What, what do you think makes that part of training so valuable? Well, I, I'll let's start by saying why I think so many coaches are afraid of it. They're afraid of it because they focus too much on the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is one rep, maximal effort, one rep. You know, I get that. I know, I competed in the one rep, <laughs> you know? Um, so they're afraid of spending too, time, too much time away from it. They fear if they're too, it's been too long from attempting maximal efforts, then they're losing something. They don't quite understand there's a building process to it. Now, I told you my programming comes from Dragon Mirror a lot, and he didn't spend many time, much time at all in tens um, or eights. Bob Morris did, though. And in my coaching career, I consulted with Bob Morris once and said, Man, I, I just, I'm having too many of my athletes pinned at the bottom of a clean. He goes, give them 10s. And I go, what? That's blasphemous. You can't do that. And he says, yeah, yeah, you know, we, you know I could never do that with you all because Dragomir was the head honcho. But, you know, when I trained, and Bob Morris has put plenty of people on the Olympic team, you know, back in the day, um, he said um, I would give them 10s. And so I started playing around with that early, early on, you know, in my coaching career. And the results was amazing. You don't have to spend much time in tens and six. And so um, I think coaches stay away from it, again, because it's too focused on the end. And to your question, which was um, why, or what do I feel is so beneficial, is the cycling and the building for the testing. Too many people, they spend too much time testing. Yeah. I mean, how many guys you see, especially the young guys, I blame it on guys, because I used to be one, right? Going into the gym, and it's like, every day has got to be a max effort for one. I mean, that is not planned, proper planned training. And so, um, you know, plus I read. I've done my, my fair share of reading and speaking to strength coaches, speaking to Olympic weightlifting coaches. I've spoken to swimming coaches and they have their own periodization, their own form of cycling as well um, and how they deal with, uh, with swimmers. And, you know, I mean, I think every coach needs to, uh, you know, to absorb everything that's going out there so they can pick what works best for them. But it's, it's very, very valuable, in, in my opinion, to understand in order to test, you gotta build to test. Yeah. Look, look here, people watching this. <laughs> what you just heard is one of the most valuable understandings of, of programming and of periodization that you will hear. And so many people, it seems so intuitive to me. Right. Build, then test variation than specificity. Yeah. And people miss out on it all the time, and it's for exactly the reason you said, is that they're, they're looking at the, the goal right here right. in front of their face, and yeah, hitting a PR this week, great. Yeah. But does this week matter in the 
training cycle, in the annual plan, in the quad, in the career. Yes. Well, you know, it's funny because the whole sport, every sport, comes down to the same basic principle, which is doing the right things at the right time. Timing. Right? Right. And so Timing. all of periodization, all of training is purely just managing the right things at the right time. Right. You know? Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's funny you say that because I was waiting, uh, I was uh, waiting for Chad to finish because I was going to say, um, it's timing, right? It's timing. It's when you do these things, right? I don't need someone to peak mid-cycle. Right, right. It's cool to say, and I know you want to put it on your Instagram yeah. and shit, man, but yeah. you know, and maybe that has something to do with it too. Uh, we didn't have that. Sure. Yeah, we didn't have that back in the day. The only person I was trying to impress were three judges at the end yeah. of my cycle. That's who I was going for. I would think about these judges who were just faceless to me when right. I was competing. But I didn't care about impressing anybody else, man. You know, it's like when I get a drop in at my box usually a weightlifter, drops in, right? Not looking for any guidance or anything like that, just needs a place to get his session in, right? Or her, and I rarely ever charge for that. You know, I just, it's the sport. Come on in, who's your coach? I may or may not the coach, tell him I said hello, the gym is yours, enjoy. And what are they doing? Going heavy. Now they're missing everything, but because they're attempting heavy, they think that looks impressive. How about you go lighter and look badass? I think that if your movement is sharp at a lighter weight, people would be more impressed by you, young man, than to come in here and do loads that your coach probably doesn't want you to do, and you look like garbage. Yeah, yeah. And maybe you make one, but it looked like hell. Yeah. That's not impressive to me. Plus, I'm, I pride myself on, uh, I like to think I'm a, I'm a technical coach. Right. You know, I mean, I, I can build someone to be strong, but I, uh, I, I love the challenge of technique, right? Mm -hmm. My website is www.oliconcepts.com. The term Oli was something I had to get over at first. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, people call me, I want to get Oli lifting. And what the hell is that? What the hell is that Oli? It's weight lifting, damn it. Well, I fold it, clearly. And I own Oli Concepts now, which is, which is my education platform. You know, And it's free if anyone visits my website, oliconcepts.com. When you get there, you'll see a ton of tutorials and tips and things, and it is free. I don't charge for that. Uh, maybe I should, you know, maybe I'll make a killing, but <clears throat> I'm an old school guy and just believe in sharing information. Plus, if you watch a video, it'll help you, that's great, but that doesn't mean you're gonna be a champion. I mean, you still cannot supplement a competent coach, and so I encourage everyone to go find one, see one, and spend time with one. Floor time is, is much better and, uh, you know, than, than the remote online coaching thing. I do that as well because I want to help people and it's what's in demand. And I won't say no. I will spend time with videos and programming for people because I love what I do and I want them to learn. However, it is still not better than having someone face to face. Uh, but my website's the best. Um, my email, camargo.oli at gmail.com. And um, to my detriment, I'm always accessible to people. So Instagram, you got one of those? I do. Uh, you know, I was forced to get one a couple of years ago because I fought it. I thought I can survive this industry. Without it, I was wrong. Uh, but my Instagram is Camargo underscore Oli. My Facebook is Oli Concepts. You bought into the Oli full on, huh? I full. did. It's on my t-shirt right now, man. Never go for it. Almost yeah. a tramp stamp. Yeah, hey, I draw the line at Oli, though. I will not call it Oli. No, thank you. Uh, at Max Ada underscore or at Max underscore Ada on Instagram and Facebook. I'm Chad Wesley Smith, at Chad Wesley Smith, at Juggernaut Training, Facebook, Instagram, all those places. As always, thank you to our sponsors, Virus International, Thunder King Brewing, uh, Grind Sports Nutrition. You can use Maddie 10 there. She'll get an extra plug like she needs any help with that. <laughs> nope. That's the Jug Life Podcast. Thank you for listening. Uh, if you liked it, give us a five-star rating on iTunes. Thank you very much. Thanks, Danny. Thank you for having me. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, man. Thank you.